Yo, welcome back. All right, today we're gonna to talk about how to find the derivative of an inverse, but we probably should quickly review what it means when a function has an inverse, all right? So by definition, we have this. So what does it say? It says f of g of x equals x or g of f of x equals x. So in other words, f and g kind of undo each other. So whatever you start with as an input, you get as an output. So I can kind of sketch this one here where if I have some x in my input, the first function to act would be g. g is going to go ahead and map it somewhere else, right? Map it to a y, map it wherever. It doesn't matter. I right? will say g of x. But now what we do is we take that value, that g of x value, that output, and we now map it with f, and f is going to map it right back to x. So this would mean that g and f are inverses. And this depiction here would be the same thing, just kind of call this f and call that g, all right? So inverse is denoted f superscript negative 1. That's not uh, 1 over f. You don't view that as a negative exponent. You're like, how am I going to know? You're going to know, right? It'll be in the context of the problem. So rather than writing f of g or g of f, we could write f of f inverse of x. It's going to be the same thing as f inverse of f of x which is going to be x. They undo each other. It's like they cancel each other out, so to speak. All right, so that's notationally what an inverse is. So let's see it a bunch of different ways. First, let's see it through a mapping, which is kind of like what I just showed you, but this is just a little bit more complete of a picture. So on the left side here, we have our domain of f. So these are the inputs into the f function. The f function will map them somewhere else, call them y values over here, right? So this would be the range of my f function. Well, the range of my function f actually turns out to be the inputs or the, dom or the domain for f inverse. So f inverse is just going to map everything right back to where it came from, right? So you see here, capital D means domain of f, same as the range of f inverse, and then kind of vice versa, right? The range of f is the domain of f inverse, right? This mapping would be what we call a one-to-one -one mapping. So not only does every x have one y, but every y has one x, so one to one. Functions that are one to one are going to be invertible. They will have what we call an inverse, or maybe even more specifically, an inverse function. So what does it mean when a function is not one to one? Well, here would be an example of a function mapping, f, and it's still a function, right? Every x has one y, right? Negative two, that's the input. It has one output, it's four. Two, that's the input, it has one output. So every x has one y. So this still would be considered a function, right? But it would not be considered one to one. You actually have two x's going to one y. It's like a two to one scenario. Now notice since it's not one to one, the inverse function will not exist because if the input is four, where do you map it to, right? Do you map it to negative two or do you map it to two? There's a decision that would have to be made. So that is not a well-defined function. Now, you can think of functions like soda machines, right? You go up to a soda machine, Here's a soda machine, and you press the Pepsi button, right? So you press this, be like the Pepsi button. You press Pepsi, you know what you're getting. The Pepsi soda is the output. You're getting that, right? This would be an example of maybe there are two Pepsi buttons, right? But again, you press the button, you know what you're getting. You're getting the Pepsi. It's happening. If you looked at the inverse of this, this would be a bad soda machine going the other way because it would be like pressing the button four and not knowing what you're getting, right? Maybe you get Diet Shasta sometimes. Maybe you get Dr. Pepper. Who the heck knows? But you're not going to know. All right. I don't know if that made any sense. Hopefully it did. All right. So that's seeing it through a mapping. Let's see an inverse function now through a set of ordered pairs. So if you have a function that is represented by ordered pairs, in this case, three sets, one, three, two, five, four, nine, think about it. These are x, y pairings. So when the input of, of one is plugged in the function, the output is three. Right. So one gets mapped to three. 2 gets mapped to 5, 4 gets mapped to 9. It's an ordered pair situation. Well, then how would I find the inverse? Well, it just undoes this mapping. So if 1 gets mapped to 3, the inverse would say that 3 gets mapped to 1, right? And if 2 gets mapped to 5, then the inverse would say 5 gets mapped to 2. And if 4 gets mapped to 9, 9 gets mapped to 4. At the end of the day, guys, what are we doing? We're just switching the x and the y. So now that leads you to believe that, oh, if a function and its inverse, if, if you're simply just switching the x and the y, 
then graphically, the way you see that is they would be symmetric to the line y equals x. So here I graphed a, a general function. It's actually an exponential, but for the purposes of this, it's just a function, right? It's inverse. If I asked you to sketch the graph of the inverse, you basically would fold the line, fold the paper over on this line y equals x, and that little imprint here, that image, would represent the inverse, all right? So a function and its inverse are going to be symmetric to the line y equals x. And that makes sense because if x, y is on the graph of f, then reverse of that, switch them up. Y x is on the graph of f inverse, okay? All right, how about finding an inverse algebraically? So I actually did the work here because I don't want to do this with you uh, just because it's, it's, you know, this is like algebra one type stuff, right? So the example says, if possible, find the inverse of this function. Well, you know it would be possible because that's a line and lines would be one to one, right? So you're like, all right, well, how do we do it? Well, you start off by replacing your function notation with y. So that's my first move right there. Then you switch the x and y because that's how a function and its inverse are related. And then you solve for y. And that's what we did here. And now at the very end, just replace y with what it represents, which it now represents the inverse of x. Okay, or the inverse of f, I should say. I'm sorry, f inverse of x. So what does that mean? That means that this is your function, this is your inverse, they undo each other. So for example, if I just took an input like 3, right, where would f map it? Well, 5 times 3 is 15 plus 1, that's 16. All right, so let's see if my inverse that I found is going to undo it. All right, so let me put 16 into f inverse. Well, 16 minus 1 is 15. 15 divided by 5 is 3. There, there you go. All right, now that's not actually verifying. It's just checking one point. If you actually wanted to verify it, you would just do the composition f of f inverse of x, and you would also do f inverse of f of x, and both times if you did it, you would just get x, which says you're going in a loop. Again, I'm not going to show you that. Uh, that's a, that's a pre-calc thing that I want to stress right now. Take a look at this guy, example two. If possible, find the inverse of this function, All right? Cube root of x plus 1. Again, take that function notation, replace it with y. That's my first move switch the x and y. Great. Now solve for y. The way I would do that is I would cube both sides, right? So if I did that and show this step, I'd be x cubed equals y plus 1 because when you cube a cube root, it goes away. And then you would subtract 1 over and you end up getting x cubed minus 1 equals y. And of course, that now represents your inverse. So this function here is the inverse of that function. Again, test it out. Let's do, let's take 3 again. All right, actually, you know what? Let's make a value that's a little bit better. Let's do 7, All right? Where is g going to map 7? Well, 7 plus 1 is 8. The cube root of 8 is 2. Okay, let me take now 2 and chuck it into my g inverse and see if it works. So, all right, here we go. It looks like it's going to be 2 cubed, which is 8, minus 1 is 7. Yep, it worked. Again, that's not the verifying part. That's just me checking one value. To verify it, I'd have to go ahead and actually work out g of g inverse of x. Right, and also do g inverse of g of x, do both of those like you did in algebra two days, and both times you would get x, which means you're going in a loop, which verifies that what you found is in fact the inverse function. All right, so we'll do one together here. You might want to pause the video. You probably should pause the video and try this one on your own. If possible, find the inverse here. All right, well, let's go ahead and do it. Replace that with y. You got y equals ln x plus one. Next move switch the x and the y's. Next move is to solve for y. So I want to isolate that ln term. I would subtract 1 from both sides. And now a couple ways I can do this. I like to think of it as exponentiating both sides with the base of e. So if I exponentiate that side, I'm just going to get e to all of that side. You can't exponentiate each piece. You got to exponentiate the entire side because exponentiating is not distributive. All right. And then I'm also going to e to the this side. Now, the whole reason why I did that is because e to the element of y is just y. So then get e to the x minus 1 here. What does that now represent? That's h inverse of x. It's e to the x minus 1. So this will be the function that undoes that. And again, if I wanted to actually verify it, I would do h of h, h inverse of x and h inverse of h of x, and both times I would get x. Okay? Um, and you know, like if possible, how do I know it's possible? Because I know what a log function looks like that's been shifted up one. All right, it's going to have an inverse. It's going to pass that horizontal line test. Why are we saying this? 
all because it's a log function. So you can't put zero or negatives in the input of a log function, right? You would break it. It wouldn't be real or it wouldn't be defined. So you need to have that. And the range of logs is all reals. All right. I'm talking fast, but I'm just trying to get through that stuff. All right. So before we get to the calculus, one last thing, which is does a function have to have an inverse, right? So let's consider f of x equals uh, x squared. It's this parabola here. If I was to go by the idea of just flip all the x's and y's, because that's how you find an inverse relation, relation meaning not necessarily it's going to be a function, you'd get this blue graph here, right? So if I took this graph and reflected it in the line y equals x, in other words, switched all the x's and y's, the red graph would reflect to the blue graph. Now, is the blue graph a function? And hopefully saying no, right? If I looked at the x value of 4, there's two outputs there. There's that and there's that. So it's an inverse relation, but it's not an inverse function. So then the question becomes, well, what can I do to f so that I can talk about an inverse? And hopefully you're saying from back in the day that you can restrict the domain of f. So if I take the domain of f just to be values that are greater than zero, so in other words, just look at this branch and reflect that, that now would be this guy, and that would by itself pass the vertical line test. So that would represent the inverse function of that restricted domain f, right? Now, that's the accepted one for f of f equals x squared, but it doesn't have to be that. Like, we could have said, hey, you know what? I'm going to decide to restrict my domain to be x less than zero, right? So my f restriction is going to be x less than zero. Well, then that would mean that my inverse of f would now be that lower branch there, okay? Now, it's kind of interesting when you look at this because if you went through the procedure, say you didn't realize any of this, and you're like, ah, oh, you just gave me a procedure. You basically said, hey, replace this with y, so y equals x squared, switch the x and y, and then solve for y, you would plus or minus square root both sides, right? So this is there's two things here. This is plus radical x and negative radical x. So hopefully you can see that this top branch is y equals positive radical x, and this bottom branch is y equals negative radical x, and the one you pick would depend on how you restrict the domain, right? You're going to pick this one if you restrict the domain to be x greater than zero, and you're going to pick this one if you restrict the domain of f to be x less than zero. All right, so moral of the story there is you can always restrict the domain of a relation or of a function, I should say, really. Uh, to make it so that you can have an inverse. And when we say inverse, 99% of the time, we are really saying inverse function, right? We kind of, it's kind of implied. Um, and if we want to talk about just inverse relation, like just switch the X's and Y's, like this blue graph here, then you really should emphasize relation. All right, so a couple of theorems here. One, it says a function F has an inverse, F inverse, if and only if F is one to one. We kind of saw that in the mapping before, right? As long as f is one to one, so every x has one y and every y has one x, that means in either direction that you go, you'll have a functional relationship. So we say it has an inverse. This is the definition of one to one. It's like you pick up a college math textbook. It says a function f of x is one to one if f of x1 doesn't equal f of x2 whenever x1 not equal to x2, right? That's kind of like weird how that's written, but it's basically saying this, that if your two x values, right, your two x values are not equal, then the functional values of those not equal x values will also not be equal. So you'll never have a situation where you have two x values that are not equal pointing to the same x value like I did before. Like that can happen according to this definition. So that's like a fancy definition for why f is one to one. Now, how do you see it in like, and I don't want to say real life, but in like real math life, right? So when we're dealing with graphs and stuff. Well, you can see a function's one-to-one -one by seeing if it passes the horizontal line test. So let's start by looking at this guy here. This is not a one-to-one -one function because it fails the horizontal line test. Now, why might that make sense, right? Well, think about it. You have some x value here, and it looks like it's, you know, it's a little less than two, but you have some x value, say it's two, and it's mapping to, I don't know, this y value here, it's like 1.1. But then you have another x value over here, say negative two, and it's mapping to the same y value. So yeah, left to right, it's a function, right? The parabola, that's a function, passes the vertical line test for functionality. But if you tried to map this in reverse, you're now pressing the Pepsi button, and you don't know if you're getting Pepsi or Diet Shasta, right? So one input's going to have two outputs when you look at the inverse mapping. 
right? So long story short, a function's one-to-one -one if it passes the horizontal line test, all right? So this is not one-to-one. -one. This would be, no matter where I draw my horizontal line, it's hitting once. This, the same thing. It's a little debatable here, but it's going to be the same thing. And this guy here, the same thing, all right? So one-to-one, 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 not one-to-one which means this guy has an inverse without having to restrict the domain. This guy has an inverse without having to restrict the domain. This guy has an inverse without having to restrict the domain. So now finally, let's discuss calculus. What do we know about one-to-one -one functions? Well, look in this example here. The derivative, no matter where I draw in my tangent line, the slope of the tangent line, it looks like the derivative is always gonna be positive here, and it is. So when my derivative has one sign, in other words, it's just always positive, that means the function is going to be always increasing, which means it's going to have to pass that horizontal line test. So a positive derivative is telling me that I have something that's one-to-one. -one, all right? Think about this guy. Here you have positive tangent lines here, but on the other side of that, we'll make them orange, these are all negative tangent lines. So sometimes the derivative is positive, sometimes it's negative. Well, guess what? We have something that's not one-to-one. -one. All right, take a look at this example, very similar to the first example, except there's one teeny instant where it levels off and there's a horizontal tangent line. So it kind of does this, levels off for an instant and then goes back up. So it's not level for a bunch of values, it's just level at one value. So that's why you can put the derivative could be zero at just an instant. So that's still going to give you one to one. All right. And then this is a very similar example, it's just kind of like the opposite, right? So if I look at this graph, these tangent lines, they're all what? No matter where I draw them, they're all negative, right? So my derivative would always be negative. Again, it's always the same sign. In this case, it means it's always decreasing, which again means it's one to one. So if you know some information about the sign of the derivative, you can actually tell the C if a function is going to be one to one or more importantly, if a function is going to have an inverse, all right? So it says existence theorem. It says if the domain of f is an interval on which the derivative is always positive or always negative, notice I kind of got rid of this or equal to, so we don't have to like get into the nitty gritty of it can only be equal to zero at an instant, right? So I got rid of that. So if I know the derivative is always positive, or always negative, well, then f's going to have to have an inverse. It doesn't tell you what the inverse is, but it tells you that it must have one. That's actually really important. All right, and a lot of times in, in, in math, existence theorems are huge. So in other words, just knowing that something exists and not even being able to find it is oftentimes in math a big deal. All right, so let's do a cheesy example. It says show that f of x equals x to the fifth plus x plus one has an inverse, and I hooked you up saying using the derivative. So you're like, all right, well, maybe I should get the derivative. So the derivative would be 5x to the fourth plus one. So I'm looking at that and like, what am I supposed to do with that? Well, look at this expression. It's 5x to the fourth plus one. Look at this from a numerical standpoint. I can plug in positive x values. What type of number would this evaluate to? Hopefully you're saying positive. You're like, oh, what if you throw in zero? Okay, that'd be zero plus one. Well, that's still positive. Or what if you throw in negative x values? Yeah, but you're raising it to the fourth power. So that's going to make it positive. So this right here tells you that f prime of x, f prime of x is going to be greater than zero for all x. You can write it out fancily like this, or you can just literally write for all x. So if it's greater than zero for all x, that means, therefore, f is one to one, and f inverse exists right? Because the function would always be increasing. So it's going to pass the horizontal line test. So it means there's going to be an inverse. Now, here's what I'm talking about. Just because you know the inverse exists, how would you find it? And you're like, ah, just go back to what you did before, right? Change this f of x to y. And so you get y equals x to the fifth plus x plus one. Go ahead, switch your x and your y's. All right, so you get that. And now you have to solve for y solve for y and you're like hmm that really stinks all right go ahead and try and solve for y all right there might be a big monetary uh prize if you go ahead and do that all right you're not going to be able to do it and it's going to be next to impossible to do quite honestly sometimes it's straight up impossible so the idea is even though i can't find the inverse 
by looking at the derivative that gives me behavior about the function, in this case, that it's one to one, which tells me that the inverse exists. So even though I can't find it, I know it exists. That's kind of like the underlying thing about uh, what I'm about to show you. All right, so what's this theorem? I just kind of threw a theorem in there. It says if a function f is continuous and invertible, then f inverse is also continuous. I guess the easiest way to, to think about that without having to do a proof of continuity is to think about it. If you have a graph that's continuous, that means you can trace it without lifting up your pen. Well, if you now take that graph and flip it over in the line y equals x, you haven't created any breaks or holes. So you're still going to be able to trace it without lifting up your pen. So it should make sense that if f is continuous, that f inverse is also continuous. All right, and then this note is what I said about a thousand times. All right, so you can pause it and reread it if you want. So let's get to finally calculus now. All right, so let's read this. So you pick up a textbook and it says, hey, if f is a one-to-one -one differentiable function where g is equal to the inverse of f, that's what that means, and the derivative uh, g of a is not equal to zero, then the inverse is differentiable at x equals a and is equal to this. All right, g prime of a equals one over f prime of g of a. And you're like, what are you talking about? Why the g's? Well, the reason why we do the g's, first off, instead of just saying the derivative of the inverse, is because this is what the notation would look like f inverse prime no one likes that right that's ugly so rather than writing f inverse prime and confusing people and not knowing is that a minus prime is that a minus one is that a minus one prime we say let's make everyone's life easy let's let g equal f inverse all right but understand that g is representing the inverse here all right so that's pretty important so now why is this i can do the proof i'm not going to do the proof the proof is right here it's a pretty nice proof to be honest so if you want to pause the screen uh pause, you know pause the video and, and look at that knock yourself out uh but i'm not going to do the proof with you there's a billion different ways you can teach this if you google this you'll see all billion all right i came up with what i think is one of you know i've had the most success with student wives in doing this so here's going to be the deal you ready here are two functions, f and g. It's just like a general picture where they are inverses of each other. The problem or the, that you're going to have is it's going to ask you to find the slope of this red tangent line here. So in other words, it's going to say, hey, what's the derivative of the inverse at some point? But you're not going to know what g is, which means you're not going to be able to figure out what g prime is. So how do you do it? You're going to relate everything back to f. So first off, you get the corresponding point by just switching the x's and y's here. No big deal. You know how to take the derivatives of functions, so you're going to be able to figure out the slope of that blue tangent line. No big deal. The question is now, how do you figure out the slope of the red tangent line? Well, think about this for a second, right? Slopes of tangent lines, they're just slopes. So the slope of this line is some delta y over delta x, right, at this particular point. Well, how is that going to relate to the slope of this line at that corresponding switched point? Well, if you're just switching the y's and x's, couldn't I just switch these and write delta x over delta y, right? So you're basically just taking the reciprocal of what you got here. You're just doing one over this, and that's what this says. You find the slope of the tangent line on f because you know how to do it, and then the slope of the tangent line on the corresponding point on the inverse is just going to be one over that. And that's going to be the process. And we're going to think about every problem that we do in that manner again if you google it some people do it implicitly some people do it with hey just memorize that formula if you look at some old statistics right, they had this uh, question on a multiple choice exam and i forget what year but they the, the statistics of it was like three percent of this you know of the nation got it correct all right and that's because they're teaching it the wrong way so here we go let's do question one we're going to do question one two different ways all right hopefully it like shed some major light on things all right so we're going to do it the non-calc way first all right so and maybe i should have even started with this before i even show you what i just did so we have f of x is radical x and g is equal to f inverse and it says find g prime of four so in other words find the derivative of the inverse at four this is the key here so you're like well why don't i get the inverse right because this one i can so change the f of x to y right switch the x and the y solve for y by squaring both sides so i get this that y equals x squared right so now this now represents my f inverse which by the way we're calling g of x so i'll just clean that up and be like all right i know that g of x 
is going to equal x squared, which makes sense, right? Square rooting and squaring are inverse operations. So now I want the derivative at 4. Well, all right, you want the derivative of 4, maybe I'll give you the derivative at x first, right? g prime of x would be 2x to the 1. So now g prime of 4, pretty easy, 2 times 4 is going to be 8. And that's it. Pretty easy stuff, right? All right, well, you're not going to want to do the problems this way because think about this one here. How are you finding the inverse of that? Switch the x and the y. You're going to get 2y plus cosine y equals x. You ain't solving that for y, people, right? Impossible. So there's got to be another way to do this problem, and I'm going to show you, all right? So when you see this notation, g equals f inverse, I want your brains to click off and say, draw a general picture. What the heck do I mean? I mean, get your y and your x-axis going, have a function f like that, and then have an inverse, which should look like it's symmetric in the line y equals f, and just say g equals f inverse. So there is my general picture. No matter what function they give you, I don't care. I'm always labeling it like that. I'm always drawing my picture that way. Now I'm going to formulate the problem. What does that mean? Well, I want to find the derivative of the inverse at 4. So I would come over here anywhere, put a point, and say I'm trying to find the slope of that tangent line. Now, what's the x value here? It's 4, comma, I don't know. You'd agree with that. 4, comma, I don't know what the y value is. I don't know what g is. So now I have to relate everything back to the corresponding point on f. Well, if this is 4, comma, I don't know, then what is this point? You should say it's I don't know, comma, 4. Okay, and what I want to do now is I want to find the slope of the tangent line at this point. So you're like, all right, remember, they gave you f, it's right here. So I can say, all right, I'll get f prime of x, f prime of x, see, I'm supposed to have that one memorized, it's 1 over 2 radical x. So now I want f prime of what? And I don't want f prime of 4, I want f prime of, well, I don't know, I don't know what this is. 4 is the y value on f. So you're like, oh, all right, that's no big deal. Let me plug 4 in for the y value for f. So 4 equals radical x. Square both sides because I'm solving for x, and I'm going to get 16 equals x, right? So then this value here is 16. <clears throat> so now when I do f prime of 16, I'm going to get 1 over 2 radical 16. Well, the square of 16 is 4 times 2 is 8. I'm going to get 1 over 8 here, right? Now, what did you find? You found the slope of this tangent line, right? So m tan here is 1 over 8. Remember the problem. We want the slope of the tangent line on g. That's the inverse. Well, how does the slope of the tangent line at this point relate to the slope of the tangent line at this point? They're just flipped. The delta y over delta x has become delta x over delta y's. So the slope of this tangent line would be 1 over 1 over 8, which of course, if you're just flipping that, is just 8, right? So this would tell me that g prime of 4 is simply going to be 8. Notice we got the same thing. Now, why is this a, a more robust, I'm making stuff up, method? Because you don't have to know what the inverse is to answer this question. Think about your work over here. Did we ever say the inverse was x squared? No, we didn't. We do know it exists because radical x is one to one. So I know it exists, but I don't have to know what it is to actually answer this question, which is pretty neat. And you still might be saying, well, I still would do it this way because I'm stubborn. All right, well, here you go. Now you can't do it that way, right? So here's the story. <clears throat> I see these words. What does that make me think? Draw the general picture. All right, so here's a nice little y-axis. Draw, draw it a little bigger this time. This is an x-axis. What do I mean draw a general picture? I mean draw a general f. There's f. And then a general inverse, right? Call it g equals f inverse. There's my general inverse picture that I want to work from. Formulate the problem. What's the problem? I want g prime of 1. I want the derivative of g at 1. In other words, the derivative of the inverse at 1. So again, it doesn't matter where you put the point. I'll put the point right here. I'll put the point there all the time. So that means I want the slope of that tangent line. That's the problem, to find the slope of that tangent line. So now what is this point? It's like a chain reaction now. This point, the coordinates are one comma, I don't know, right? Because we don't know. 
So now that's going to relate to what point on F? Well, they're inverses, so it would relate to, I don't know, comma 1. Now you're going to need to find this X value. So I'm going to do it first right now. Say, well, how do you do that? Well, you have an equation for F. So plug 1 in for the Y value and then solve for X. Now you're like, I can't solve that for X. Well, it turns out that a lot of these problems, you're going to have to solve it by observation. So in other words, guess and check. So look at this equation, appeal to your superpower numeric senses, and decide what the solution is. And what the heck do you mean? Try values. Try 1. Try 0. Try pi. Try pi over 2. Don't try negative 10,000.56, because these will always be easy, right? So I'd start with 0 always first. So what do you mean? Well, try plugging 0 in here. What's 2 times 0? Zero? 0. What's the cosine of 0? Oh, 1. Well, bam, right? So I just solved that equation by observation, by guess and check. So this is zero. So clearly my picture is not drawn to scale, right? Because this should be on the x-axis and this should be on the y-axis, but that doesn't matter, right? This is just to formulate stuff in my brain. So now what do I do? Well, now, remember, they gave me f. I can get the slope-producing machine. The derivative of f is going to be 2 minus sine x, right? Derivative of difference, uh, sum, sum of derivatives. The derivative of 2 is 2. The derivative of cosine x is minus sine x. So now I want to find the slope of this tangent line. Well, I have the point and I have the slope producing machine. So I want f prime of 0, not f prime of 1, guys. The x value here at the corresponding dot point is 0. So that's going to be 2 minus the sine of 0, sine of 0 is 0. So I just get 2. So now I'm going to label my picture. The slope of this tangent line is 2. So then what would the slope of the tangent on the inverse at the corresponding point have to be? And hopefully you're saying it's just the reciprocal, the delta y over delta x is become delta x over delta y. So it would just be a half. So because of this, therefore, g prime of 1, right, it ends up being 1 over f prime of 0, but I'm just going to write that it's going to be a half. This picture will always kind of like hold your hand, help you visualize it, and work you through the problem. Again, think about the craziness of what we just did. We found the derivative of g at 1 without knowing g and without knowing g prime. We related everything back to f, which we did know. And again, that's kind of the whole point of all of this. All right, so that was good stuff. Much longer than I wanted to be. I apologize for that. Go ahead and attack the homework, and I'll probably just post homework solutions, I will not post a video of me doing it.